fine. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the exploration of the African dawn here in the northeastern corner of South Africa. We're sitting in the 3.5 million hectare wilderness wonderland that is the greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. We're in the South African part of that, the Kruger National Park, on a little section to the west of that area called the Sabi Sands and a little section in the middle of the Sabi Sands called Juma and Arethusa to the west of us here. My name is James Hendry. You are most welcome. On camera we have Brian the Thumb Joubert. That is Brian's thumb there. Uh, Brian is substantially larger than his thumb. He is in fact six foot three and is topped with a very spiffy blue buff and a blue hat and some sunglasses and a jacket because he thinks it's cold. He will not be cold later on today because the weather is threatening to push a sweltering 40 degrees Celsius. That's about 7,500 degrees Fahrenheit. At the moment, it's 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually very pleasant indeed. Out on the other vehicle is Scott Dyson. He is being filmed by the diminutive but highly skilled Viam Dornbrach, and they are following the tracks, hopefully, of a female leopard. We heard her calling earlier this morning, and there was some wildebeest going, bow, bow, bow which is what wildebeest do when they see something that might want to eat them. A leopard, of course, will not eat an adult wildebeest, but a little one, it might. So that's the situation, the state of play this morning. You are on a live safari, and I was hearing yesterday from the directors that there are still some doubting Thomases amongst you, still those who believe that this is some kind of great ruse, that we are, could not possibly be live here from the wilds of Africa. To you I say, we are. Send us a question, hashtag Safari Live, or questions at wildearth.tv. We'll answer you live, and that will hopefully dissuade you. If it doesn't, well, just enjoy it anyway. It's still a lot of fun. The plan for us this morning is to help try and find that leopard, and we'll see what happens during the course of the dawn. The sun is about to peep up over the eastern horizon, and while it does that, we'll get on with things and see what we can find out here. You are most welcome, and it's great to have you along for the ride. There's one other thing I wanted to tell you. Oh, yes, of course. In the final control, of course, we have Nicola Austin, and on the keys, Kirsten. There's a little bird flying across. Right, now, Cindy, in Florida, you want to, you, you, you've obviously been a long time watcher. I'm just waiting for the sun to peep up because it's a good idea to just stop here for a while and listen to see if that leopard isn't walking past some other kind of antelope which will shout at her and that, and thereby give away her position. And Cindy, you're in Florida and you, you want to know if, if uh, perhaps you can see the final control, if we can go in there and show you that, if you can come and see where we live, um, what we do in our off time. Cindy, I think within reason, yes, we can do that, certainly. I think um, you don't want to see what some people do in their off time. It will probably, uh, you know, put you off slightly. And then you also want to know where we get our groceries and things from. Well, that's very easy to tell you. We get our groceries about 50 kilometers from here in a dubious settlement called Hutzbreit. It is a very small town and until recently consisted of a petrol station or gas station, as you probably say it, and a fairly dodgy supply store. It is a much larger town now, and it seems to be a place where people come and settle in a small town environment where they live on what they called wildlife estates, which are basically um, sort of game reserve areas where you can come and live. A, you have a little hectare of land, and it's a really nice, beautiful place to live. It's in the shadow of the Drakensberg Mountains, and it's actually turning into quite a pretty little town. So that's where we live. 
At least that's where we buy our groceries from, and we will take you past the final control probably next time we have a bushwalk, because we could, could then take we could then take the camera into the final control and we'll show you what the girls look like in the morning. I warn you, it's, um, it's a dangerous sight. Right, uh, Sharon, you want me to do that wildebeest call once more, which I shall, and then we're going to continue on our way. The wildebeest goes like this. Bow. 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 And that's, of course, where it gets its common name, the GNU. It's called a GNU because it goes, Brian, what does it do? Mm. Bow. <laughs> Bow. Right, on we go. Let's go and see what we can find out here today. Scott is off his vehicle, not having a rest, tracking. So with any luck, he'll come up with some more tracks of the leopard that came past here and caused the alarm in those poor gnus. Ooh, hello, Varietas. You are watching on YouTube and you say you're watching with a new viewer. That is very exciting. Hello, new viewer. I hope you have a name. I hope it's a nice name. And please feel free to talk to us, either through Varietas or of your own volition. Ask us a question. Give us a comment. Tell us what you want to see. Tell us how you're feeling. <laughs> Hello, Donna. You, you were watching yesterday, obviously. And you want to know how my GoPro film of the sunrise came out. Donna, highly disappointing results. I was very excited, didn't get a chance to look at it until yesterday evening. Plugged it into the computer. It downloaded 7,000 photographs, which it then strung together into what could be called a time lapse. And all I saw was a very small pinprick of orange light coming up in the far distance and a lot of grey clouds scudding overhead. So not what I would describe as a massive cinematographic success. We will try again forthwith, probably not today, because the sun is already coming up. On that note, let us head across to Scott Dyson. He will give you an update on whether he has found more tracks of the leopard or not. And while he does that, I will continue looking here. and good morning and welcome. I'm just repositioning the vehicle to try and show you some leopard tracks quickly, which are over to our right here, heading in the opposite direction. We're going to wear some clear ones. There are two there that are OK. You can see the faint toe marks and pug mark at the back of a female leopard now. She's heading up this road that we've driven down. So. We're going to assume that she's not very close by to the road, otherwise we would have seen her. But what's interesting is that those tracks are heading in the same direction as another set of tracks coming towards us. So my guess is, and of course I could well be wrong, but it's possible that these tracks belong to a, a, a female leopard called Shadow, is my guess, and the other sets of tracks that we had further back also heading in this direction are from her mother called Karula. And this is the area that their kind of territories buffer. It's not a very fixed line where one territory starts and another begins, but this is the kind of buffer zone. So it would be incredible if we were lucky enough to see them interacting and competing for territory. So that's the news about the leopard. Um, I was so excited to tell you about that. I forgot to mention that my name's Scott, for those of you who may be joining for the first time. And then I'm teamed up with Viam on camera. Just listen to the radio carefully. So, Texans also just found some more tracks. Um, 
Texans just found some more tracks of a leopard, but I've just found something very interesting that's happened here. I'm just going to hopefully be able to position the vehicle accordingly. It looks like we may have missed this interaction between two different leopards because I can see one set of tracks here. Okay, so there's the two tracks there, Vim. We got those. And then I'm going to move across to where these tracks came from. Oh no. What happened was she zigzagged from this side of the road where I saw some tracks and then I saw the other tracks on the other side and I thought it could have been two leopards walking alongside one another but her tracks merely crisscrossed over and then past the buffalo dung and then back up. Anyway, there are some tracks that Texan called in. Another guy who's out and about with us this morning. And he says that they appear to head down towards the, the Juma camp. So a good place to be would be in and around the Juma waterhole or the Gallagher waterhole. Either spot there she could pop out for a drink and you're going to be heading across to one of those spots now with James. So if you were wondering where Peter the Pan Hippopotamus is, well, wonder no longer. He's here at the Gallego Pan, and he's wandering about having a bit of a graze. He was slightly disturbed when I pointed at him. We drove up here, stopped next to the water where he was reclining, and I then pointed at him, and he took offence and got up. So I do apologise to him profusely. I'm sure he'll come back although I'd rather he went to the other pan which he has soiled beyond recognition. This one is still relatively clean. But it's still nice and cool for him, so not difficult for him to be out of the water. You can see the mud on his back, so he's clearly been in the other pan during the course of the night. And there is his beautifully paddle-shaped tail so that he might spray his dung liberally and demonstrate to any other hippo that that's where he lives. Now he's looking at us. You see how he looks from side to side? It's a bit like when you watch an elephant walking through the bush. If they're watching you, they look slowly from side to side just to make sure that you're not chasing them. A dreadful, dreadful time this for hippos because it's just so dry. That scene that you can see there of a hippo walking through that kind of landscape. It looks like an October scene before, from before the rains. It does not look like a height of the wet season scene. And they, of course, together with the warthogs, are going to be the animals that begin to suffer the most as this drought progresses. So we don't begrudge them their time in the little pans, while they certainly make the water a bit messy for most of the animals to drink. It really doesn't affect most of the animals. They're very happy to drink that sort of water. It just uh, starts to niff a bit, a bit of a smell. OK, let's leave him there. I think what we're going to do is continue along the road here. I keep hearing one or two things alarm calling, but nothing particularly vociferous. So Scott's over there. Tax had the tracks heading this way. We're going to drive around towards the Juma Dam from around here, just around the camp. Here is Gallagher Camp in front of us. And if this is Karula, and it probably is, given that it's a female in this area, that's is her territory. Our shadow could come in here, but it's most likely Karula. Then she does like to go actually into the camp and through it. So let's keep an ear out for the monkeys calling, or some bushbuck alarm calling, or some birds, especially the grey go-away bird this morning. Hello, John Bradford. You're watching with your seven-year-old daughter, Alyssa, for the first time. Good morning, Alyssa. It's lovely to have you with us. And you want to see a leopard, Alyssa? I share those sentiments. I, too, want to see a leopard. Brian, do you want to see a leopard? I would love to see a leopard. Brian also wants to see a leopard. So, Alyssa, we will do our very best to find a leopard. Remember, though, that this ain't no zoo. 
So it's quite difficult to find them because they're living in their natural habitat. They are very well camouflaged and they leave very little sign. That's the whole point of being a leopard, you see. But we will definitely do our very, very best to see if we can find a leopard. I will keep watching the road very carefully for tracks. Some hyena tracks around here, lots of impala tracks. This is an interesting one from Mark Tilbury. Mark, you're looking at that hippo and you say, just excuse me not looking you in the eye, Mark, I'm just checking the road for tracks. Mark, you want to know if hippo can look, or you've read that hippo can still look obese despite the fact that they might be nutritionally deficient or in a state of abject starvation. Mark, I haven't read the same thing. And so if we look at that hippo that I saw there, I think they're okay, to be honest. I don't think that's gonna last for long. The reason I say I think they're okay is because I have seen hippo with their hips showing and looking pretty ropey. That said, I'm sure that he, while he is maintaining his mass, the nutritional status that he is maintaining cannot be ascertained from his size. So I'm sure that he's missing nutrients because of you know, the amount of grazing that there is available to him at the moment. Thank you for that, Mark. Some very fresh buffalo patty around here. Hello, Brian on Twitter, as opposed to Brian on camera. Brian on Twitter, you are interested to know whether I am ever going to get a new hat because this one's looking a bit old. Well, you see, Brian, when one buys a new hat, the whole point of buying a new hat is that so one can make it look precisely like this one is now. I feel that this hat is just coming into its own. So no, I won't be buying a new one anytime soon. This one looks like I've run through a couple of Zizifus bushes and you know, struggled greatly in my job, which is, of course, extremely dangerous, you know, and I'm very hardcore, exactly. That's exactly why you let the hat get like this, to show the danger that you have to experience every day. I have found absolutely no further sign of leopard, I have, however, found an enormous blockage in the road. So while I remove it, let's go and get an update from Scott. Further sign is not a problem. And through the process of elimination, hopefully we're going to work out exactly what's going on. But what I would like to do first is just show you exactly what's been going on with the leopard tracks. Now we found the initial set of tracks heading down where Teller access, so I'm going with a stick towards the camp and apparently the last tracks veered off the road towards the camp environs which is difficult to see here on this map. Now then we drove down Zoe's road and we found another set of tracks heading up so it could well be the same set of tracks that continued all the way down those are the initial tracks that I showed you about here, midways down Zoe's. Or it could be two different leopards. So I'm just checking we're on Impala Road now, and then we're going to come back down via Teller Access to where we last had those tracks. But in the chance, the off chance that it is a second leopard, she will, the kind of buffer zone for Karula and Shadow is, oh, is kind of this area here, this line of the sticks. So if I zoom out a little bit more, It'll give you an idea. Arethusa is on the left of the stick now, and Shadow comes about that far into Juma. She just touches into Juma as a general rule and doesn't go much further than that east. So she spends more time west. And who knows, maybe we'll bump into either of them or none of them, and maybe one of their lovers, maybe Tingana, a big male leopard, or maybe a big elephant bull. 
has been one walking down this road in the same direction that we're heading. There's a track there. Beautiful. Okay, well, it's, my signal's no good yet, so we're going to send you back to James. Bit of trouble with Scott's signal there, but mm, sounds like he's got two female tracks of leopards. Is that an English sentence? I think it is. Right, I'm just going to quickly get hold of him because I want to know what's going on there. I haven't found any further tracks here. Scott Dyson, come in. Scott, do you copy Scott? He's clearly not copying me. Never mind, I know vaguely where he is. We'll head around in that okay. sort of direction. Oh, there we go, he's back. Scott, have you got an update on those tracks? I know, I've done it. Could be the same. Hear him? Oh, dear. Sorry, I lost you there. Can you try again? No, no, I've got the tracks that I had going north of those could have been leopard. Uh, we had uh, going down with the access. Copy, thanks. Right, you heard Scott say that. I'm going to do a part of plans and come back down with the access. But I can hear some very upset Franklins through there. Now, what happens is, if the Franklin see a predator and they're disturbed by it, they'll fly up into the air going And then when they land again, they'll go Now, that's what I'm listening for now, and I don't hear that So I'm thinking that perhaps maybe they just got cross with each other and had a bit of a fight. So Scott is going to head back in this direction. He hasn't found any further fresher tracks. I will continue to watch the ground. Basically, what we'll do is just sort of, ooh, no, that's a hyena. We'll just basically circle wider and wider until we do come up with something, hopefully. Interesting question from Savannah on Twitter. Hello, Savannah. Just, I will answer your question now. I'm just trying to find out what's going on with Taxon here. He seems to be doing a three-point turn of great speed in his land cruiser. It's always good to give a sort of Superman sign to people. I find they sort of look at you strangely and expect you to fly out of the car. Why, uh, Savannah, you want to know if the landowners would ever consider giving water or bringing in water for the animals. They do that, actually, already. Savannah, those two pans that we see, the one on the Juma Dam pan and that Gallego pan that we were at with the hippo just now, are pumped, which means that the they're attached to a borehole somewhere, and that borehole pumps water into them. A borehole, I guess, if you're in America, would be called a well. And they pump water into those pans, and that is simply for the animals to drink. And while it is altruistic to the animals, it's also, of course, for game viewing. And then if you look to the right-hand side as we drive over, this is a dam, and I suppose it would also be considered sort of water provision. And when we have rain, 
Uh, the last time we had rain was some time back. Then we have a vast body of water here with all sorts of interesting things going on. At the moment, it is a dust bowl with a number of fish skeletons in it. Here we go. So, Paul, you're in New, Or New Orleans, and as we look at this dust bowl, you want to know how long since the last decent rains. I think we had some decent rains last before... Um, I think there was a 10 millimeter spell in January, which is nothing. It's about it's less than half an inch. And then there's a beautiful um, woodland kingfisher there, Brian. He's going to come back. Oh, look at him. He's on the ground. He's going to come back the same perch. Beautiful. Paul, before that, there was some decent stuff at the beginning of December, a bit in November. We sort of had 20 mils here and there, which is a good rain. But I mean, I think there's probably been only about 100 millimeters this year in total, which is nothing. It's about a sixth of what we normally get. And I'm just having a bit of a listen. It's always a good idea just to stop and listen, especially if you don't have tracks, just to make sure that there isn't something alarm calling, some impala, perhaps a nyala or a bushbuck going, bow, bow. But at the moment, all is peaceful calm, just the very subdued dawn chorus of the drought. <laughs> We've got a question from th somebody I've, I've never had a question from before. Your name is Pouty Lips. Pouty Lips, what a very nice Twitter handle you have. You want to know if I ever feel sorry for the animals during the drought. Of course I do, absolutely. I hate seeing animals in distress, as do most of us, unless we're psychopathic. But at the same time, I try to take a slightly bigger picture view of things. So this landscape has survived for countless thousands of years. The animals have come and gone through here. They have survived as, you know, as species through countless droughts and countless floods and countless changes in environment. And so this small drought, which to our very short human lifespan, which seems like an absolute disaster, and certainly if you're in the Kruger National Park right now, further east of us, this looks verdant in comparison with some of those areas. It looks dreadful to us if we don't take a bigger picture view of it. And so it's very easy to become highly depressed by the look of things. And I try to take a bigger picture view of it. And at the moment, that's not too hard because the animals are surviving. They have enough to drink at these pans. But it's when the grazing starts to go that it's really going to be difficult for us to look at. But we have to take a bigger picture view of it. We are not in charge here. The Earth has been in charge here. The universe has been in charge here for many, many thousands of years. and. I think it's our role to observe most of the time. And I wouldn't be bringing food in. Some landowners disagree. They'll bring in lucerne and that sort of thing. The problem with doing that is, the problem with intervening during a drought is that when the drought goes away, what you have is a state where the landscape is overgrazed. When the rains come, the soil erodes. And you actually create a bigger problem. You, call a you cause a snowballing, much larger problem. So while it would be good to bring in a couple of bales of lucerne, some salt licks and pump water and make sure that everybody could eat what they needed to eat without a die-off of animals now. The next time the rains come, there's going to be a real problem. So, yes, party lips. It's a difficult one, but that's how we have to deal with it, I'm afraid. Let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. I have found absolutely nothing that vaguely resembles a leopard track. I'm going to keep searching and I'll catch up with you a little bit later. So I'm still scanning desperately to try and work out what the female leopards were up to last 
a set of tracks uh, heading in a northerly direction up via Till Axis, which confirms my initial thought of thinking that it's its tracks that we were following. Uh, the, the kind of end track now that we had was heading north, and the initial track that we had of a, another leopard was heading south. So even though it's possible that she turned around and headed straight back in the direction she's come from, it's unlikely. So I think they kind of skirted past one another. Maybe got to see one another. Maybe the broke a but we're trying to now piece together where the second, and I'm guessing, Shadow is the second female who's trapped. Hornbill. Not a leopard. Scott is really having trouble. It's not Scott having trouble. It's Jigger having trouble with the signal today. Sorry about that. So I'm afraid you're going to have to make do with snippets of the Adonis-like figure of Scott Dyson. In the meantime, let's enjoy that red-billed hornbill, which is now hopping into a position where Brian is having to contort himself like a contortionist. Brian, there's a much easier one just in front of us here. <laughs> Same bird in front. Or on the tree, if you want. If you want that one. Okay, good. Fair enough. That one is foraging. Very good runner. Is the hornbill, you can see. Now, of course, a red billed hornbill spends much of its life digging in antelope dung. I'm very pleased that I don't have to do the same thing. Now, just watch the way they run. For a long time, I used to find these tracks on the side of the road, and I didn't know what on earth had made them. And a hornbill leaves a unique track, because you can see it runs sideways. You see it doesn't run forward. It runs in a sort of slightly crab-like motion. I don't know if, you've, if any of you have ridden horses before. Uh, they'd be described as a half pass. They sort of run with their legs crossing over. And they leave a unique track. And he'll be picking up termites, odontotermes, probably the fungus growing termite that lives under the ground rather than on top of it, or even the harvested termites. They won't be affected too badly by the drought, the hornbills, because they're pretty good at picking up insects from the ground. This is a lovely red billed hornbill sighting. Hello, Sammy, you're in Texas. I think those were two youngsters that have just been chased off by an adult. Sammy, you're in Texas, and you want to know what my favorite bird is. My favorite bird, because of the piece its song engenders in me, is the white-browed scrub robin. And it goes... <whistles> Yesterday evening, I wasn't driving, and I climbed up a Scotia tree and I was sitting there watching the sun go down, and one of them started to call just as it got dark. And it just filled me with a great sense of peace, as it always does. So that's why I like them. They're pretty nondescript. We hardly ever see them. But one of the robins. And it's interesting. I thought I was alone in thinking that robins are um, particularly all favorite birds, really. In South Africa recently had a poll of its favorite birds. And despite the fact, I'm just gonna check my microphone batteries. Despite the fact that the, you know, we have an intimidating array of spectacular birds out here. We've got eagles and we've got parrots and we've got various other amazing things. The bird that South Africa chose as its most favorite is something called a Cape Robin. And I think that's because it lives quite a lot in urban areas. And what it does is it gives people a sense of the wilderness in the madness that is city life in South Africa. So that was the Hornbill sighting. I've just heard that there are some elephants not too far from here. 
So I think maybe we'll head towards them and see if we can enjoy an elephant sighting. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. Okay, Scott's got some picture actually, and he's actually got a very pleasant mammal to show you. Let's head across there. I'll head to the elephants. Well, isn't this a beautiful scene, everyone? And I'm very happy that our signal rectified itself here to show you this beautiful view of what looks like a female giraffe. And even though you can't see much very clearly, those two little horn-like structures sticking out of her head appear quite fluffy. And that's a good indicator that it's a female, not a male. Oh, no ways. And now you get to see what a male looks like. Can you believe what an epic scene? Possibly a day late. That would have been a very good Valentine's shot. But we'll bank it. And as Nikki just said, it, it's still Valentine's Day for some people somewhere. Wasn't that epic? We're going to continue now. They've just crossed over our northern boundary. And we are going to try and work out where the leopardess are hiding. I think there's two squirreling around Juma at the moment. And we just need to find one of them, hopefully. Wonderful that we've just got confirmation through from Liz, who's watching in America, and said that how strange is it that it could be her birthday here in Africa, uh, not yet in America, and I guess it, it, it's still Valentine's Day there. So happy birthday from you, from all of us here at Wild Earth. An African birthday we can celebrate before you can. And also happy Valentine's Day, I guess. Combo deal. about the areas that I traveled through on my leave and with specific regards to how the drought is affecting other parts of the Kruger and or South Africa. And it's really interesting stuff, James, because uh, the, the effects are incredibly localized of the droughts. I mean, even between Juma and Arethusa, there's a, 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 a noted difference between how dry it is here and how much more moist it is across on the western side of, of Arethusa. So even in a very small localized area, we've noticed big differences. Um, and yes, certainly through the Kruger National Park, and we tra traveled quite a long way through the Kruger Park, James. Let me show you exactly what we did, because it's easier than explaining it. Um, basically, we are currently situated about here on the map. So we are somewhere here, and where we were staying, which is uh, in Hoodspreit, is a town outside here, and we came into the park at Orpen Gate and drove up to Satara, where we spent the night, and then from there we drove up to Olifants Latab and then out the Palabora Gate. And this is a big chunk uh, of area, considering that this is 300 kilometers long, the whole map. We, we did a fair chunk of it, uh, of the Kruger Park, so don't be fooled, don't think it's a small distance that just because we drove along that road. And through this area, you get a lot of basalt plains, and then further north, you get Mapani faults, um, which is a kind of tree, the Mapani tree, and it just takes over there. So in those areas, in the basalt plains, in and around Satara, it was incredibly dry. Not much of food uh, at, at all. We saw a dead buffalo there. Um, it could have died, and it looked to have died of uh, starvation or, or kind of natural causes, weakening as opposed to being killed by large predators. 
And what was interesting is that the vultures had managed to feed on it entirely, but its skin was still on. So because their hide is very thick, the vultures and birds of prey can only feed from the inside out. Excuse me. Yes. <coughs> ah, Wasserbock. Don't be alarmed. We come in peace. It appears like they are like nervous. Let's just stop here. It's a whole lot of youngsters, young males, even young calves. I'm not seeing too many adults here. They'll probably be around, though. Beautiful morning sunlight on them. So yes, James, uh, various parts of the Kruger were very, very dry. Um, and I guess the different types of vegetation and soil structure substrates also directly impact on how much food is left. But it's looking desperate. The animals, or at least the herbivores, and we must stress that the herbivores are in trouble. The carnivores are in for a time of plenty. Oh, look, they're up on the bank. Try and move forward. Hello to Austin. We would like to know if water like are simply too big and powerful for certain predators to take down. We should get a nice little gap here. And Austin, yes, for some predators they will be um, too small. Uh, so, or well, the predators rather will be too small. And in other cases, like for lion and for big male leopard, waterbuck, especially small waterbuck, will be on the menu. So for some animal like wild dog, definitely yes, even cheetah, even female leopard, they're not going to take any chances with large prey. For a couple of reasons, it's very difficult to overpower large prey, but then also how do you feed on all of it without it being stolen? So there's a kind of couple of reasons why. If you listen carefully, you may hear a woodpecker drumming. It's off in the distance, not very close by, but there's a very slim chance you can hear it. It sounds like it may be communicating and drumming on a hollow branch to send out its thoughts for the morning. And speaking of communicating, Drain James has started to gently drum a message through to me, and it sounds like you guys are going to be heading over to him. Oh, no, cancel that. He's got no signal where he is, but that was the plan for a moment. But you shall continue with me. It's not often you get to smell water back. What smelly antelope? I'm just trying to work out if that is there, Mike. Smell. That could be a nice spot to view them from. I'm not sure if I'm dreaming or if I could smell them, but they do have quite large scent glands which keep the shaggy coats well oiled. So you can smell them from time to time. Isn't this a pretty scene? And I love these shots now where you can look at animals kind of from eye level or ground level because it's elevated and it's sitting at the same height as VM's camera, that, especially that individual that he's on now. It gives you a great idea of, or perspective of how big they are. Good. Well, James' signal's recovered and he is calling you across urgently. Toodle do. Look, a little elephant coming across in amongst a herd of much larger elephants. There we go. The elephants, of course, doing massive vegetational change. We are going to be talking, have been talking extensively about the drought, and Party Lips was asking whether we feel, a, you know, kind of... Sorry, I 
I seem to be struggling with my sound from the lapel mic today. I don't know why. It was absolutely fine yesterday. I will have to try and modify that. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Right, party lips, you were saying about the drought, you were asking about that sort of thing. And the one of the interesting things that happens during a drought is that because we have elephants in the area, I'm just going to sneak forward while I'm talking to you. Because we have elephants in the area, during a drought, especially during a summer drought like this, the elephants, instead of eating grass, which is what they would normally do at this time of year, are eating trees. And they are modifying the structure of the vegetation profoundly. They are knocking over trees all over the place. They are creating clearings where there wouldn't necessarily be clearings otherwise. Now, were you to come through an area like this for the first time, look at this little thing over the edge of the termite mart here. I'm not going to go further than this just now because we're going to put the camera bang into the sun if I go further forward from here. You'd come through here and you'd think, oh, these elephants are the most destructive things in the world. Look, it looks like a wasteland. Yes, it does. But after another year of good rain, that will open up space for all sorts of things and possibly even create a more open vegetation type. And I'm, I, I don't know this for sure. Nobody can tell you this for sure. But I'm of the opinion that this entire area used to be a lot more open. In other words, it had far fewer trees than it does now. And I think that the hunters that came into the area in the late 19th century, um, well, not late 19th, mid 19th century, and hunting, I mean, you read horrific statistics of them taking out sort of 26 tons of ivory at a time. Can you imagine the number of elephants that would have had to been shot for them to remove that kind of ivory? I think that you'll find that 200 years ago, this area was a lot more open than it is now. And I think the reason that it's thickened up is because the elephants have been absent for so long and their numbers were maintained by the Kruger National Park a bizarrely thumb-sucked number of 7,500 for the whole Kruger Park uh, for many, many years. And that was maintained with culling. That thankfully has gone out of fashion, isn't happening anymore, and I think that the elephants are going to return this land to what it looked like pre the arrival of human beings. Now, the Valentine's Day bird from yesterday is with Scott. Let's go across to him. I'm going to stay with the elephants for now. So, the elusive carmine bee eater, these are the first ones that I've actually been able to show you this season. I don't know, I think you've had a few glimpses possibly with Jamie and Brent, but they are incredibly, incredibly pretty birds. Hard to see from this distance, and also the fact that there's a youngster perched below, which doesn't have its adult plumage yet, doesn't paint the best picture for them, because they're quite dull and drab. But to give you an idea of their bright coloration, I've got a picture here that on my phone of these birds in all their splendor and in all their glory. So take a look at this. Here's a large flock of them, and they nest in the banks of rivers and cavities that they excavate. That's them all taking off there. That's a youngster, you can see quite drab still. And then here's an adult in flight with a, with a butterfly. They're incredibly maneuverable. They've got that long tail streamer out the middle, and beautiful pinky reds and turquoise blues. So, the southern carmine beads, they haven't been as plentiful as they ordinarily would be to the drought. Good, well, I'm glad we got you a glimpse of them. Okay, here we are, the beautiful birds, carmine bee eaters. We're sitting here with some elephants. I'd like to go back wards to show you the rest of the herd, but I don't want to do that. They're right behind us in the road here, and I think that will just give them a bit of a fright. So we're going to sit here and look at the one in front of us and see what he does. I think it's a young bull who's not quite, you know, he's not definitely not ready to leave the herd yet, but he's also not very happy to be around the youngsters anymore. 
like a 13 year old human being. There we go, now you can sort of see them behind us. Right behind us. That's the matriarch, I think. An enormous female. Now, Liz, you are in Wisconsin, and you want to know when the last major drought was. Liz, I came into this area in the year 2000, and I don't remember us having a drought like this ever during that time. Between then and now, we've had one or two dry-ish years, but nothing like this. And if I was to guess, I would say that the last really big drought, and I think Steph had just started working in the bush around here, was in about 1987. 19, sorry, 1997. Steph is not that old. Now, you can see a beautiful cow there, at least the matriarch suckling her young calf. And the calf will be, as well as taking milk, of course, she'll be taking comfort. A little bit nervous of the vehicle, and she'll be drinking for comfort as well as for nutrition. Isn't that wonderful? You can see much too big to be fitting underneath mother's belly at the moment, so probably almost 14 to 16 months old. That little calf, and they'll wean between sort of, well, probably between two and three years. So they do drink for quite a long time. If you want. I'm just pointing at another one that's come around the termite mound here to Brian. You can see how bright that sun is. It really is going to be a cooker today. Hello, Kyle. You're in New York City. You weren't always in New York City. You were born in Durban. Very nice. Like Kirsty, I would like to hear you say your eyes. I hope you had some nice fush last night. Um, Kyle, you want to know about the Sand River and the depth of the Sand River, and is it still flowing? You say you used to enjoy sitting on the deck of Singita Ebony Lodge overlooking the river. Well, I'm sitting on the deck of Singita Ebony Lodge is one of Life's rare pleasures, I would imagine, for anybody. But looking over the Sand River, Kyle, you'd be pretty sad now it's dry. And it, of course, is a perennial river normally, and it normally only dries out in very dry years. And it is dry now, and to have it dry in February is extremely unusual indeed. So, Kyle, no water there. And then you also want to know about the reserves north of Durban. Are they struggling? Everywhere struggling, Kyle. I don't think they're quite as badly hit as we are here at the moment, but yes, they are certainly dry. Reserves north of Durban, I'm assuming you're talking about Lefluem, Folosi, and possibly Pinder. Look at this little thing. Look at this little thing coming up, the termite mound. Young bull, just showing us how very strong and tough he is. It's actually a young cow, I think. And now, walking back down off the mound because she's realized we're not that terrified of her. Let me... I'm just going to roll backwards here. Oh, no, that's actually OK, isn't it? That's all right, then. Now, Jane, you're in Dallas. And just for those of you who are also wondering, this area is a summer rainfall area, which means that the wintertime is completely dry. In fact, we don't see a cloud often for three months sometimes. Just peeping her head up over the top of the mound. So the winter time sort of between, well, I mean, winter, our winter lasts about three days. Look at that, isn't that, oh, this is spectacular. Don't fall off the termite mound there. 
That is just fantastic. <laughs> and she'll be wanting to eat here on the termite mound because the grass at least is a little bit more nutrient rich. very vicious elephant. The youngsters like to give a little bit of trouble like this. They are highly entertained by a, a diversion from trying to find something to eat. That's really nice. Now, Keith Myers, you're a very sharp human being, obviously. Here comes another elephant towards us. Oh, very strong. Keith, I will get back to your question shortly. You want to know who the third person on the vehicle is. You spotted us from the Juma Dam cam. Before I talk about that, I just want to explain what's going on with these elephants and why I'm not starting the car and driving off in terror. These are small elephants. They are youngsters, probably about 13 or 15 years old, they're just testing their strength. Um, they're not being serious. They don't present a threat to us at all. If that was a big six-ton bull or a four-and-a-half-ton cow, I would be far more nervous and would not be sitting here any longer. Keith, the third person on the back of the vehicle is a fellow called Dave. David. David arrived yesterday. He is shortly to be joining us on the camera team, so you won't be seeing a great deal of him. You will be hearing a great deal about him and uh, witnessing his art form. Brian is giving him a coaching session. He will be thrown off the deep end and well under the bus today with a small camera. So that's who that is. <laughs> Brian's just going to turn around quickly. This other elephant is sitting, standing right here, showing us um, well his rear end there. This is not your best angle. Now, only about a meter and a half from the vehicle. You can see my shadow <laughs> on his stomach. <laughs> this is wonderful. Hello, Sabrina. You're 12 years old and you ask a wonderful question. You watched a doc documentary called The Secret Lives of Elephants. And during the course of that documentary, there was a deformed calf with a gammy leg and eventually the mother had to leave it, um, basically to its own fate because it couldn't keep up with the herd. And that must have been a very traumatic thing to see. I've seen it once before out here with an elephant that for three or four years kept up with the herd at Londolozi, but eventually the herd could no longer wait for her, and she was eventually killed by hyenas. It was a very traumatic thing to witness. Anyway, Sabrina, you want to know if I've seen any deformed elephants here? No, I haven't. It's very unusual. It's far more unusual than it is in human beings, and I'll tell you why. It's because with medical science and human beings, of course, deformities, or what we call deformities, or medical anomalies, the, a real, really good example is diabetes, for example. Type 1 diabetes is a genetic defect that manifests, and only people who carry the gene for type 1 diabetes can pass it on to others. Now, in prehistoric times, that simply wouldn't have happened because diabetic people wouldn't have survived. And so the gene wouldn't have perpetuated. Now, the same thing goes for deformities in animals out here, where you have a situation, if there is a genetic defect, the animal that has that genetic defect will probably not survive to breed. And so that genetic defect is immediately disappears from the population. You may have heard that the other young bull here is coming from behind. He's watching Brian. 
So that's why we don't see a lot of deformities. Yes, they do occur. Do they survive? No, quite often they don't. And I must just tell you, Sabrina, that for an elephant herd to have left a sick and ailing individual, it must have been a very traumatic thing for the herd because they are very, very careful with their sick and with their injured animals. So I'm sure it was only after a very long time that they took it upon themselves to make the decision to leave the youngster to its fate. But it does happen from time to time. Very nice question. Thank you, Sabrina. Highly intelligent. James Richard, while we let this herd graze off into some bush uh, that you would need a fairly substantial bulldozer to get through, so I'm not going to follow them through there. Very nice question about, and I don't know the answer for sure, but I'm going to give you what I think the answer is. You want to know what is the success rate of a first-time mother? Does that calf survive? How well does she do? Pretty good, you know, and it's because the mentorship pr program, if you like, if we can give it an anthropomorphic name, within a herd is excellent. So a young mother will give birth, possibly around 11 years. That's quite young, but it can happen around 11 years. And she will be shown the ropes. The whole herd will look after the calf. The whole herd will take care of the calf. It's a bit like a human village society, a sort of pre- or Stone Age human village society where a young woman will give birth and she won't be like we do in our Western nuclear societies where, you know, the, this young couple takes off a baby and there they are and they suddenly have this mewling thing and they don't know what to do with it. It's very much the same as an old human society where you've got a constant, constant presence of older, more experienced females. And an elephant society is very like that. And so young calves do survive. Physically, I don't think birth is particularly trying for elephants. It's not like it is, for example, for a first-time hyena mother, which often dies in childbirth, or indeed like a human being. And so physically, I don't think it's a problem. And socially and emotionally and learning to deal with the with the trials of being a mother, I think in an elephant herd, it's a really good place to be. Of course, it gets easier as they get older, up to a certain point, and they get more experienced, and therefore it gets a bit easier. Nice question, thank you, James. Right, we're gonna leave this herd here, press on. I'm not really sure where we're gonna go at this stage. I think we're gonna go to Sydney's Dam and see what we can find there. Now, Brian, you don't often send us questions. In fact, you never send us questions. But we did meet you at Arethusa uh, a few months back. In fact, quite a few months back now. Brian, you're in Philadelphia, and thank you for your question. I hope Philadelphia is, oh, good grief, is treating you well. Um, you want to know about that story I said a hyena took out a, an injured elephant, and you want to know you can't sort of pictured in your mind how that would have happened. You know that lions sometimes do it in Botswana, but how did hyenas do it? Well, it was a very small elephant, four years old, and a massive clan of about 25 hyenas. And they just wore it down eventually. Hyenas' jaws are, of course, extremely powerful. The elephant had no way of defending itself. It was weak, it could hardly move. Its legs, the back legs of this elephant bent the wrong way. And so it had this kind of, it, it was sort of dragging itself along. And that's why it couldn't survive. And so the hyenas actually had no trouble at all taking it out. Once the herd left it alone, you know, it really wouldn't have been difficult for even fewer than 20 hyenas to take it out. So we're now on the Bifflesook cut line. The Bifflesook cut line is our northern boundary. And that's Biffles Hook to the right-hand side of your screen. And to the left-hand side of your screen is Juma. Scott is on the border between Arathusa and Juma. And he is trying to he found more male leopard tracks. He's found thousands of tracks today. They were heading into Simbambili, where unfortunately we are not allowed to go because we do not get signal there. 
but that's okay. There should be a female leopard somewhere around Juma. Ooh, very nice inquiry from Marion in Texas about elephants again. You want to know if an elephant can come into estrus again while she's still suckling a calf, uh, her current calf. Not immediately, no. The birthing interval is probably about two and a half to three years. Not the birthing interval, sorry. The birthing interval is probably about five years. So the estrus interval is probably about two and a half to three years, which unsurprisingly is the weaning age. Excuse me. Whew. A small bubble of gas escaped. Luckily, I did it in a very genteel fashion. Did you notice that? I did. I didn't belch. Yes, I didn't belch. I felt like belching, but I didn't do it. Uh, so Marianne, two and a half years to three years, of course, the weaning interval, and that is unsurprisingly also the estrus interval. I think it's very like with human beings, that sort of situation, isn't it? No, it's not really. Forget that I said that. I think many animals are, sorry, very, the sa very similar with lions and leopards. They will not come into estrus again until the cubs that they, their current cubs have weaned and indeed are independent. Again, nothing is black and white out here at all, is it? And Monica in San Diego just pointed that out by saying, should endangered species like wild dog and rhino be affected by the drought, would we step in and do something about it? Yes, I believe we would. Monica, remember, wild dogs are actually going to thrive in a drought because, well, just for a certain period, because the antelope are becoming weaker and the vegetation is becoming more open, wild dogs are going to have a field day. They're not going to struggle to catch anything for a long time. And unless it gets so bad that the number of antelope and their other prey species drop to this point that they actually can't find anything to eat. So they're not a problem to worry about at the moment. Rhino, what would we do about rhino? Monica, I think if the drought got really, really severe, the only thing to do with something like rhino would be to remove them to go and put them in a situation where, to try and put them in a situation where they could be farmed or certainly held in captivity where they could be fed properly and then reintroduced once the drought ended. Because of course, if you were to try and feed them here, if you were to bring in bales of lucerne and salt licks, well then everything else is gonna start eating those too. So I think that's, that's what we would do. Brilliant question there, Monica, thank you for that. Uh, that is, of course, is not a rhino or a wild dog. That is a zebra. The only re relative, wild relative of the ec of the horse that we get in Africa. Ec no, sorry, that's not actually true. We get one other. There's a wild ass somewhere in Sudan. I know a number of wild asses myself, but they're unrelated to horses. Now, zebra, if we, while we're yakking on about drought, which I suspect we're going to be doing for the next, well, for the foreseeable future, they are okay in drought. They've got a pretty impressive digestive system. While it's not as efficient as a ruminants, in the times like this, they thrive. Well, they don't thrive, but they do a lot better than ruminants because they have no limit to the amount that they can eat. They have a very fat stomach, you can see there, a cecum, they're a hindgut fermenter which means that they do not have to re-chew their food. Now, animals that have to re-chew their food, like ruminants, have a capacity beyond which they cannot feed until they have sat under the shade, re-chewed their food, swallowed it again, and then they can carry on. A zebra and an elephant, for example, do not have that problem. They can just keep eating. So the worse the quality of the food gets, the more they eat. So they will be one of the last of the herbivores to be affected by a drought. And you can tell that, of course, as I said yesterday, by their main condition, not by the big fat bellies that they have. 
Zebras always have big fat bellies, as do horses, well, unless they're seriously emaciated. And the main condition, you can see they're all standing up. They're what, they have what in horsey terms would be called a hogged mane. They stand up straight, and with their mane start to lie down, it means that the fat reserves in their necks have been used up, and then they start to suffer nutritionally. I'm just going to, Scott is trying to hail me on the Gave Drive channel. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, you will hear what he says. I'm holding the microphone uh, no to my of, microphone. Uh, my father's going to be crossing uh, over Triple M, but she could well have. I just didn't see the tracks. Um, I'm moving out of that area, just wondering where you are. Scott, I'm at Junction Gallagher Shortcut and Biffles Hook. I'm going to head towards Sydney's Dam. Well, there's a tiny okay, baby there. Oh, See that the behind there? There we go. Just behind there, just coming into picture now. You can just see it. There's a little baby. Little foal. <laughs> Look at that little thing. Well, interesting, Amy, you're in Pittsburgh and you were on a wilderness trail today where your guide told you that zebras do not have flies on them because of the stripes. First of all, I'm astonished in Pittsburgh that you were even talking about zebras. I wonder if you were actually looking at some. Your guide has given you one of the theories, Amy, for why zebras have stripes. It's not a theory I subscribe to, but certainly there are many that do that the reason zebras have stripes is to reduce the parasite load that they would otherwise carry. Look at that tiny little thing. I think that's about two weeks old. Maybe three or, three or four weeks. And very brown all over its body. The youngsters have much browner stripes. And you can see, look how long the legs are really struggles to even get down to the ground. You see having to spread its legs there a little bit like a giraffe. And that's simply so that it can suckle more easily, I think. Um, Amy and the legs, of course, are long so that it can run away from things that might want to eat it. Amy, zebras are affected by flies. There's no question that they're affected by flies. That's why they have that tail. And you can see that swishing tail going constantly, and that is to remove flies from the immediate vicinity. Are they troubled by flies as much as some of the other animals? I'm not sure, I couldn't say. I think that those stripes, though, are far more likely a anti-predator device than they are any kind of thermoregulatory device. <coughs> one of the theories, anti-parasite device, is one of the other theories. They may double as both of those things but I think the energy invested in creating stripes like that would be unwarranted unless it had something to do with trying to escape being eaten. Very sweet. I love the color of the black and white there, juxtaposed with the green of those wilting leaves. Oh, but James Richard, I, you say, I said nothing is black and white in the bush, and thereafter zebras ap appeared. James, zebras are not black and white. Look at them. They've got brown in them as well. It's interesting that, you know, white is an extremely unusual color out here. And I remember doing a, in my undergraduate degree, doing a, a, an exercise with a brilliant lecturer, he was from England, and he said, if you were, a, you know, think about the strategy of a, of a seed and you wanted to be discovered by something and eaten so that you could pass through the digestion and then be dropped somewhere else, what color would you be? 
We all said orange and red and yellow, and he said no. The most unusual color out here is white. So if you really want to be found by something, and you're a seed or a flower or something like that, and you want to be found by sight, white is a brilliant color to be. Hello, freedom believer. I'm not sure where this question comes from, um, but I will, I will get an answer for you. Um, you want to know if David does some artwork as well. David, do you do any artwork? Sure. David is shaking his head in abject confusion. So, um, freedom believer, David is not an artist, but perhaps will become one while he lives out here. He will be inspired by the wilderness to great feats of artistic brilliance. This is an interesting one, and I don't know the answer to it. Marcel, you worried about the drought, and if if there is a, a if the drought becomes so severe, would we at Wild Earth consider closing down? Um, the only reason we would do that is not from a wildlife perspective, but from a perspective of actually being able to maintain the camp. So, for example, Juma the camp, we are telling Gallego would have to shut down if they couldn't give water to their guests because obviously people need water to bathe themselves in and to drink. Uh, we couldn't have a bunch of smelly guests running around the place and the guests wouldn't enjoy that either. So the same thing would go for the Juma Research Camp where we live. If we couldn't bring water in there, obviously we would have to close down. There are contingencies in place though and um, certainly water bowsers and that sort of thing we'd attempt to use before we close down. So we're, we're, we're nowhere close to that point yet, Marcel. So don't worry about that. Uh, we will keep you posted, though. On that note, the zebras are heading gently into the shade. Let's go to Sydney's dam and see if anything is drinking there. On we go, Brian. Tally ho. <laughs> Ginny, you're in Texas. You obviously know horses. And you want to know why it is that the, the mane of a zebra, for example, stands up and the mane of a horse lies down. I don't know for sure, Ginny. Safe to say that because a zebra is an African animal and therefore lives in a place where, and a horse, I mean, let me let's just, just, I can't remember exactly where a horse comes from. Yes, I can. Horses come from, from Asia. Originally, that's where the first sort of horses were domesticated, if I remember correctly. I suspect what you'll find is that they ha don't have the same need to store energy that zebras here do. So the horses in Asia wouldn't have gone through periods of drought like this where they need fat reserves. And I suspect that the manes of the zebras therefore stand up only because of the fat reserves in the back of the neck. That's probably a very simplistic answer but I think that's probably, it's got something to do with it. So the ancestors of the, of the horse, which can still be seen in something like the Preswalski's horse in, I think it's Mongolia they live, still wild. There, you'll probably find that the, it's, there's a lot more to eat and there are probably fewer times of drought and flood like there are here. So they don't need to maintain the same sort of fat reserves that a zebra does. That would be my guess. You can see the mountains off there in the west, bathed in a gentle sort of haze brought on by the wind, not a cloud in the sky, and the sun is already beating upon us. I will be hiding from the sun as soon as I get back from drive today. Now, why we're not... No. Oh, Brian. 
Did you see those little birds? I was hoping we might be able to get them, but I think they've all flown off. I think they were yellow-fronted canaries. You would have seen them flying across the front of the vehicle. Oh, there's one. They are. You can hear them. There, on the top of that bush there. You got him. You got him. We never get to film these. Oh, there's that. That's him. It's a yellow-fronted canary. They normally don't sit for this length of time. That's brilliant. Fantastic. I'm really happy we got that. So seldom do we actually get them decently on camera. Fantastic. Yellow-fronted canary. Those of you keeping bird lists, that's a good one. They're not uncommon here, but very difficult to get them on camera. Wonderful. Ah, Donna, you want to know if I have a favorite animal? Donna, I think I probably do. I think it's a wild dog. And the experience that Andrew and I had a few, about a week ago, where we were just sitting on the road and the dogs came past us, cemented my view that they're my favorite. They are not afraid of human beings, but they also don't see us as prey. And so you can, they are the best animal to view on foot. They do react to us, they look at us, and they sometimes might back off a little bit, but then they completely ignore you. And so you can spend time with this voracious predator on foot, and they don't react to you. It's the most incredible experience. I think that's why they're my, why they're my favorite. We're arriving at Sydney's Dam. If there is nothing here, I'm going to hand you over to Scott. There is one hippopotamus and a great swath of fairly well grazed land. So, on that note, let's go across to Scott Dyson. He'll keep you updated on the multitude of leopard tracks he's been following. And uh, with any luck, he'll have some luck. See you later. some trouble with my earpiece and I obviously couldn't hear Nikki saying that I was live but now I do know that that is the case and this female leopard she has been slinking straight amongst us this is the road to the final control room, and I think those are some of the tracks there, VM, on the left. If you continue on, I think it's going to work out. A little bit further down. Anyway, there, there are some tracks here. In and around the final control room, the camp. And this Lepidus, or at least one of the two, I'm 99% sure it has been two, but at least one of them has come straight past us in the course of the night. If we just zoom into the signboard, and just before the signboard on the ground, you'll see the leopard tracks heading straight towards the Gallagher Camp signboards. There we go, as clear as day, you can see those tracks. And then straight above is the signboard to the camp. I wonder which way she decided to go. Left is basically down to Gallagher and Vuyatella. Straight is a kind of service entry into the back of the camp, and then right takes us along the quarantine clearings. It looks though like the leopard has decided to go straight past the final control room. Yeah, that should be from here. Well, while we try and work out where she's gone, Sandra. In Holland, who is new to the safari experience, is wondering what would happen if an animal attacked us. Um, well, with 
in trouble, Sandra, um, on this vehicle. Um, but the chances of it happening are very, very slim, and the tracks are continuing straight down the road. Your final control is just on our right, where Kirsty and Nikki and Leanne are sitting. Now, whoever the Zoomy was is going to have some questions to answer because this leopard is heading straight towards your waterhole. And I find it hard to believe that it didn't take a drink. These are the tracks on the right-hand side of the road heading straight towards the Juma waterhole. There you can see them clearly. Just heard a squirrel alarm calling, and it's always very exciting when you hear a squirrel alarm calling when you're looking for a leopard, because it could well be that the squirrel has seen what you're looking for. The tracks do continue down this road, heading straight towards the waterhole. So, I fear that The Karuna, the Queen of Juma, has pulled the wool over our eyes. She snuck past all of us as well as the waterhole camera. Oh, I wonder when she was here. Her tracks, are they still here? So, Sandra, the, the chances of being attacked by a, a wild animal archer are very slim, but I guess what would happen is you would fight for your life. Uh, if one did attack you. Um, yeah, thankfully they don't realize that they are so much bigger and stronger than us and faster. The St. Paolo does not look like he's in good shape. It looks like its eyes are completely closed. Am I imagining things? No, I'm not. He's got a lot of flies on him. Oh, shame, buddy. You are in deep, deep trouble. It can open its eyes, but it is not, it's not looking good. And just the fact that it's all alone here, not with any other impala is a, Sign of the times, I guess, these harsh drought-like conditions are proving difficult for the herbivores, and that guy there is not in the best shape. You're lucky Karula didn't find you, buddy. Or is Karula lucky we didn't find her, or who knows? So the leopard's tracks were very, very close to you. It must have drunk you last night. I'm 99% certain that would have happened. But, of course... But we'll never know. Michael Fleetwood's interested to know if she passed through the camp last night. No, Michael. Um, her tracks, we've literally followed footprint for footprints and they do not appear to have gone through the camp, skirted uh, along the edge of the camp. But it wouldn't be the first time that she has been seen in the camp. Um, it's not uncommon for leopards, especially more than any other predator really, especially in the Sabi Sands, to move through camp environments. she has done after her little drink and where she is headed to. And in order to do that, I mean, we checked this road earlier this morning and there was no sign of, of her tracks here. That was at first light, so it'll be worthwhile to check again. Hello, 
well, Bubba. And it's probably going to fly off fairly soon to join up with the rest of its family who are just feeding on this little open clearing. Great work there, VM. And you can tell that it's a family and that that one's a youngster because it's got a very small beak, smaller than the adults. Here's the rest of the family. And it looks like there's an adult that's closer towards us, and a, probably the mother, and then another younger, younger fledgling on the other side. And usually they have two or three chicks, which makes sense because the other two with dad are over there. I think. Fascinating that that leopard snuck straight past us. It really is. Even with the live waterhole feed, it goes to show that you can miss these animals very, very easily. send you across to James the tortoise. No, wait. Oh. Right, hello everybody. There is a leopard tortoise there and a private vehicle driving past. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. We are full of joy. How are you? Very well. Good. Uh, we're just viewing a leopard tortoise behind a small bush over there. Yes. Have a marvelous day. You enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Hello, doggies. Right. Okay, we'll just go have a look at the tortoise there. So we, 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 we put the camera on the tortoise and Nikki is directing, had no idea that there was a car coming past. Oh, and my sunglasses are on. It was rather a faster, sorry about that, it was all a bit of a disaster really. The tortoise is over there. I'm going to get out of the car and I'll show it to you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, let me put this out so that you can hear me speaking. My voice will be crystalline and clear. Now, take my life in my hands in order to show you Careful, James. this magnificent Careful. tortoise. You don't want it to bite you or attack. Now, this is a particularly large leopard tortoise. And in fact, I don't want to p mm. No, you know what, I'm not going to pick him up and turn him around simply because there is no water around. Now, what tortoises do when they're nervous is void their bowels. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that they wee on you. And sometimes they do, but more than just wee on you. And that's an anti-predator device that quite a few animals will use. Now, this leopard tortoise is old because of his size. And I heard at one stage that you could count the age of a tortoise. I'm happy to touch the top of him. You could, and he's hissing at me. He's going, <sighs> I'll, I'll tell you what, let's try and see if I can make him hiss into the microphone for you. That would be quite interesting. I'll do it without taking the clothes off. Right, listen carefully. Got the mic got the microphone in his mouth. He's not saying anything. How are you feeling today? He's not saying. Anyway, I heard at one stage and read that you could tell the age of a tortoise from the number of ridges that you have on the scoops, rather like you can here on um, or that you can age a tree like that. That there is a scoot, a sort of hexagonal shape and so he's got a number of scoots on his shell it feels wonderful it's the kind of it's rough but um i don't know there's something very wonderfully primal about and earthy about touching a, a live tortoise's shell even if he is slightly irritated by it 
But what these, you can see the individual ridges, can you, Brian? Yeah. So you can see the individual ridges growing along here. And they don't grow uniformly, and they also don't come once a year. Now, what happens is the, the ridge and the trough are at different times. The ridge itself comes when the tortoise is active and eating. The trough comes when it's dormant. And tortoises, of course, like many of the animals out here, will, they don't hibernate, they estivate. And estivation is a state that animals go into when it's dry rather than cold, if you, know the, if you see what I mean. But what happens is that in a drought year like this, when this animal is not eating a lot, these ridges are not going to form. And in a really good year, two or three ridges might form. And so you can't tell the age of a tortoise from the size of its ridges or even the size of the animal itself. So unless you've been with a tortoise from the day it was born up until sort of this time, you can not tell how old it is or how old it's going to be. We do know that these tortoises, though, can live for more than 100 years. And this is a particularly enormous version of the tortoise that lives out here. You find leopard tortoises in places like the Eastern Cape that are almost twice the size. But I think that's got more to do with what they eat than them being older than they are here. He's just looking at me now. His eyes are popping out. He's thinking about moving. You can just see his legs popping out of the back. I'll try and get you a sound of him moving. You'll hear, him, you'll hear him move now. Isn't that wonderful? All right, let's leave him be. I'll put this microphone back where it's supposed to be. Sorry, I forgot to turn the game drive radio down, so you're probably listening to that. That's the guys on Biffle's Hook. And on we go. Scott has found further tracks, as he's told you, and so we're going to try and go into that area to try and help him out. It's not too far down here. This is the main access road, of course, into Ruyatella or Juma. On we go. What a marvelous tortoise. That's the biggest one I've seen since I've been here. The other thing that the drought does, of course, is uh, laden the air with dust. And for those of us who have sensitive sinuses, it can be a trying time. Jamie is one of those. Oh, I haven't plugged myself in, sorry. I wondered why Nicola was being so completely silent. I thought maybe she wasn't talking to me anymore. But Jamie struggles with it, her nose streams, and as you can hear, there was a bit of a trumpet sound from behind us, and that wasn't an elephant attacking. It was, in fact, Brian blowing his nose. I can hear you, Nicola. You may speak with me. Thank you, Deb, for your very kind words. And uh, I don't know if they're concerned words or not. You say that um, watching me stalk has shown you that where I, should I be responsible for catching my own food, I would almost certainly starve, given the skills that I have as a stalker. Thank you, Deb. And we were chatting about the tortoise, and I mentioned that state that they go into called estivation. And estivation, of course, like I said, is a, it's like hibernation, but hibernation is a state that animals go into when it's cold. They shut down, they go into a state of what we call torpor, where the metabolism slows right down, and they stop using energy. Well, that means they use very minimal energy. Now, out here, where it doesn't ever get really very cold at all, 
they go into a state called estivation, and that is a result not of cold, but of dry. And Brian in Oklahoma yawned to know how long a tortoise could go without drinking. I would say probably at least five months. Maybe not quite that, no, I would say at least five months, actually. I think they'd be fine without water, as long as they had one or two things to eat, and as long as they could go into a state of estivation without being harassed by potential predators. So quite a long time. And I mean, an average human being can go without water, what, three days before they die, I think? So we're coming into that area now. I have seen one or two tracks going down the road. I'm sure Scott's shown them to you. And that's where we live, in there, the Juma Research Camp. It's not a research camp at the moment, it's a film camp. So we're just going to drive very slowly past here. And the tracks, of course, I can't see any further tracks here. And the tracks then carry on past Galago. So I'm and past the final control. The final control is in there. I'm going to head around this way and just see often this if it is Karula that's coming past here, what she does is she either goes into the camp, in which case we're not going to see her, or she comes around past the landowner's garden over here and out across onto either quarantine or the clearings in front of the Juma Dam camp. Now, no matter how many times we've driven these roads this morning, the thing about leopards is that they do move during the day, and so it's not impossible that she should just pop out somewhere as we drove past. That would be very marvelous of her to do that, rather than hide. Oh, Susie, I'm so pleased to have uh, acquiesce to your Valentine's wish. You say that you asked for a tortoise for Valentine's Day. Well, Susie, happy late Valentine's Day. I hope it was a good day for you. Let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. Oh, interesting moments with the tortoise of all creatures. Very good. And tortoises here that we've seen. So we cannot compete with James and the reptiles. He's pulling out the bag this morning. Well known to him. Decided to come and check an area that I don't think anybody's been to this morning. It's always quite exciting because anything could be unfolding there or have unfolded there last night. And that's the southeastern corner of Juma. So likely suspects that we could bump into them, possibly Tingana, big male leopard, or Mvula, his enemy. But Tingana is appearing more dominant over Mvula, and Mvula is going further and further afield. So we don't see nearly as much of them as we used to when I first started here, at the end of 2014. Or possibly some lion, possibly the Inkawuma lion have come back. So those are the predators that we can come into here, along with anything else, I guess, but they're the likely suspects. Connecticut is interested to know what would happen if lions and leopards came across one another. Well, the leopard would be terrified for its life. There's no competition between lion and leopard. Lion are far larger than leopard and often also outnumber them because leopards are solitary. So what you'll find leopards doing is hiding away, running up trees, is often their best and first port of call. 
Australians are not good climbers. And they're not fighting over territory so much as lions will fight amongst other lions for territory, male between male and female between female. Lions will kill all other predators below them if they get their claws into them. Cheetah, leopard, hyena, caracal, serval, anything that is carnivorous. Wild dog, jackal. So anything carnivorous will be killed by the king of the carnivores, namely the lion in this area. But occasionally the lions will be out-trumped by hyena, for example, an unlucky lone lion will come across a clan of hyena which will teach it a lesson. And it's merely to eliminate competition. It's competition between the carnivores. So they, and they will all kill one another. It's not just the lions that are the bullies here. Uh, the leopards will also kill cheetah, caracal, serval, jackal. And all the animals, respectively, will kill carnivores that they can overpower. Sometimes they feed on them. Uh, sometimes they don't. It all depends on the individual and the individual day. But what's interesting is that a lot of textbooks used to be under the impression that predators will not kill other predators and then feed on them. But that's absolute nonsense. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And it just depends on the individuals. And I guess how hungry they are. So there we go, that is what would happen. We've managed to, on a couple of occasions, uh, one definitely, we got a mating pair of leopard, the old big male I was talking about now, Mvula, and a female called Kotile, who was kind of out of her range, following him for his mating, in order to mate with him. And they were actually being trailed by Karula, a third leopard, and that, it was in Karula's territory, not far off to our left where this all happened. And Karula was just keeping an eye on these ongoings, and then two lioness from the Sticks Pride arrived onto the scene, which was after dark, and we switched off all the spotlights so as to not disadvantage or advantage any of the predators involved. <coughs> And thankfully, the mating pair of leopards did manage to escape up a large jackalberry tree as the lions chased them. So there was no, no issues there, but it's always terrifying being in those sightings or heart-wrenching when you know that a leopard could get killed right in front of you. There was also a breeding herd of elephants, which made things interesting. They were trumpeting and charging up and down all around us. So memorable afternoon and that afternoon was one of the only afternoons that it was a double presenter drive. The second vehicle had broken and we decided to all join forces on one vehicle and head out to go and find these mating leopards that had been avoiding us. So Brent and myself double teamed that one. First and last ever. But it was good fun. Donna in Rhode Island, I um, told you asked James this question earlier as well, and what is our favorite animal? Um, VM, what is your favorite animal first? Uh, can I have more than one? You can have more than one, you can have a top three. Okay, cheetah, leopard, and lion. Cheetah, leopard, and lion, so there we go. <laughs> VM is a big cat professor, and that's all he's interested in. Uh, <laughs> Not bad, because I'm, I'm much hugely different to that. Um, Donna, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of the big cats. Um, but my, my favorites change from day to day. And today, my favorite animal will be the panda bear. Even though I've never seen one, panda bear is a wonderful creature. Markings, and today it will be my favorite. But I don't, Don, I don't have a set particular favorite. Like I said, it depends. It depends on my mood. I'm not sure. I wonder what James's was. James's favorite animal. Oh, wild dog. Interesting. Yeah, wild dog some days are my favorite as well. But I'm not committed to anyone.
Vicky seems to think it's the leopard. That is my favourite. As that is who we are most often trying to track down. And I agree, but that's possibly through default because it's often the only predator that we can have the opportunity of tracking down. So possibly that's why it's area related. If we had more predators on our property at any given stage, then we may search for them. But I feel like just about always there's a leopard on Juma. Not the case with, with lion and, and, and cheetah and wild dog. But almost always I feel that there is a leopard for us to find. It's just not that easy to do so. As this morning is a prime example of, we had a leopard waltzing through the center of our property through heavy surveillance and she has gone undetected. on this road. Okay, well, we're going to continue on north up our eastern boundary, and you are going to go and get involved with a troop of monkeys. Mm -hmm. I think it's very nasty that Scott has referred to Brian and I and Dave as a troop of monkeys, but, um, you know, it's just the way it is sometimes. Here we are with an actual troop of monkeys, vervet monkeys, one of three primate species in the wild and four in total that we get out here. Five in total that we get out here, sorry. And they're not as common as I thought they were going to be when I arrived at Juma. I'm not really sure why, but this troop lives around the camp. They have stolen my aspirin before, eaten it, uh, laying about the place, looking slightly dazed and drugged for a while, but they seem to be okay and no ill effects have been suffered. But the reason I'm interested in seeing them here now is that they are perfect sentinels, perfectly positioned to f spot a leopard, and no leopard will walk within sort of 50 meters of this area without being spotted by these monkeys, and we are right where the tracks were heading. Now, what this means is that I don't think the leopard is around here. We're just the other side of Vuyatela camp, and so I don't think the leopard is around this area at the moment. Anyway, we'll just sit and watch the monkeys for a while. It is just amazing to me, and you know, they do look very human in many ways, but the power to strength ratio that they have, or the power to mass ratio that they have, I think is just astonishing. If you think of a human being doing pull-ups, for example, if you know somebody who can do 25 pull-ups in a row, or you'd think that they were immensely strong. If you think of a human being that can do a one-arm pull-up, so that's when you hold onto a bar with one hand and pull yourself up with one hand, you'd think they were unbelievably strong. Now, a monkey, of course, can do that with its eyes shut from birth. And they're able to propel themselves, leap from branch to branch, hold themselves up, and move with an astonishing speed. And it just makes me always feel slightly inadequate as a species, physically, when I look at monkeys and baboons moving around the place. Their incredible strength and their speed and their agility, compared with our own, is quite astonishing. It's a very small troop of monkeys. And I don't think that they're in any danger of seeing. In fact, they cannot see a predator. There's one on the ground there, Brian. I don't know if you can see that one there. You see him there? Yep. So if there was a leopard on the ground around here, there's no way the monkey would be anywhere close to the ground. They'd be in the trees going... 
Brian, you do a much better monkey alarm call than I do. <laughs> that is exactly, exactly what a monkey sounds like when it's alarm calling. That's very good, Brian. Well done. So I think maybe she turned the other way and went down towards the Milwaukee drainage line. So I think we're going to do precisely the same thing. Let's head away from these monkeys. Now, Zumi Jordi, you're in New Mexico, and you have a granddaughter who is just seven years old, and she's watching with you. Her name is Taylor. Good morning to you, Taylor. I hope you put your sunscreen on, because it's very hot out here at the moment, and we're starting to burn already, despite the early hour of the morning. You want to know what vervet monkeys eat? Vervet monkeys, Taylor, are what we call omnivores. Well, not so much as they are as baboons, but they are omnivores. They will eat insects, they'll eat fruit, they will eat, um, what else will they, they will eat bananas like you've seen them do in cartoons. But they will also eat perhaps sometimes a little bit of meat. And so they're what we call an omnivore. Thank you for your question, Taylor. I hope you keep watching. And I also hope that one day you come and see the monkeys for yourself out here. So we're going to, because of those monkeys there sitting guard, I think the chances of us spotting a leopard in and around here, if they haven't seen it, are small. So we're going to head down this road here, which is called, well, it's going to become Central Road. And we'll head along here and see if she hasn't headed towards the, the Mluwati drainage line. Not much going on otherwise. One or two impala wandering around. Everything is running for the shade at the moment. Now, Lucy, you're in South Bend, Indiana, and I know that you watch the Juma Dam cam quite a lot. And for those of you who are in the same boat as Lucy, you might want to know a little bit about the area that you're looking at when the camera is zoomed out and facing dead straight. Basically, what happens is when that camera is zoomed out and facing dead straight, you're looking due east, and you're looking towards a junction of a road called Mvubu, which goes off to the left-hand side of your screen, or the north, and then another road called Central Road or Gari. Yeah, this is Central and goes into Gari Catline. Now, there's a squirrel alarm calling, and there's a very good reason the squirrel is alarm calling. It's because there's a predatory bird there. Now, I'm going to have to stare into the sun to try and figure out what predatory bird that is. But I think I have an idea from its shape. Grief. Binoculars of the quality I'm using. It could be a grey headed sparrow. I think that everybody is a. Ooh, <laughs> ah, it is, yes. It is a brown snake eagle. You can see that from the size of its head and what we call the, the gis. Ooh, no, it's not. You know what? It's not. Has it turned its head there? I think it's actually a Wahlberg's eagle. Just, Brian, can you totally overexpose it? There we go. No, it is. It is definitely a brown snake eagle. I can see that now. I'm going with my original thought. One should always do that. Thanks, Brian. I've got him now. And we'll just try and go a little bit closer. The diagnostic thing there, once Brian overexposed the, the picture like that, was the yellow eye, which I cannot see from here. Because we're staring, he's basically sitting right underneath the sun. 
Now, the brown snake eagle, despite the fact that it is called a snake eagle, is still a threat to something like a squirrel, and that's why the squirrels, I don't know if you can hear them, are alarm calling left and right at the moment. Gosh, that is bright. That is really, it's quite something. You can hear the squirrel going. I used to be loved asking, asked, used to often be asked the question, does the brown snake eagle called a, a brown snake eagle because it eats brown snakes? To which the answer was, well, do you think that the black-breasted snake eagle only eats black-breasted snakes? And of course, the answer is no. It's brown snake eagle because it is brown itself and it will eat any kind of snakes. I'm just putting some sunscreen on everybody. Nikki has alerted me to the fact that you would have heard the spraying of it into my palm. So they do eat snakes and you can see there it's standing in a sort of jaunty angle and they've got that totally featherless leg, totally featherless leg because that helps them when they do try and catch snakes. It makes it difficult for the snake to get hold of them if in defense and very difficult for it to inflict any kind of sort of painful bite or venomous bite, should I say. Okay, well, I think we're basically just staring at a black blob at the moment because the sun is so bright behind it, so let's carry on. Let's get into some shade, Brian. What do you say? There goes the bird, taking off into the wind. Oh, and I read some wonderful stuff about bird flight the other day. In fact, yesterday and how birds fly and the structure of their wings and why they're structured like they are. And a bird like that, of course, has got quite a wide wing and quite a, it's quite wide and long. And that is only birds that use thermals to fly can have wings like that. They're not efficient at flapping at all. So they do need, they have wings like that so that they can soar and catch the thermals and go up high. And you'll find that birds that need to flap a lot have got much narrower wings. Or very wide ones and short. Uh, Lucy, apparently your bird list didn't contain the brown snake eagle and you're now up to 160. That's excellent. That is really very good. I'd be interested to know how many of you who are keeping lists had the yellow-fronted canary on your lists from today. Because I, that's the first time I've managed to get it, uh, maybe the third time we've managed to get it on screen properly. Pat, you're in Massachusetts and you want to know if we have anything similar to your U.S. Um, Roadrunner. Pat, the only thing I know about the Roadrunner is that he's a very wily chap and he managed to pull one over Wily E. Coyote on every episode of the Roadrunner that I ever watched, despite having Acme pianos and anvils dropped on him from a great height. I don't know anything about the biology of the Roadrunner. As far as and now I know, and I know I have been told this before, but I've forgotten. As far as I know, the Roadrunner is actually a distinct family that only occurs in the New World. So I don't think we get any relatives of them here. So I'm sure there's going to be somebody, one of our viewers will know the answer to that question. But my impression is that we don't have an equivalent family out here. Meep, meep. Hmm. Hello, 
Lexter Dexter. I'm assuming that's not the name your mother gave you. If it is, well, you know, you can't choose your family. Um, Lexter Dexter, you want to know about hornbills and what the largest prey a hornbill can take in. Of course, that depends entirely on the hornbill, Lexter. And they're, they're designed such, their bills are designed such that they don't compete with each, with each other for food. So the yellow-billed hornbill, or the red-billed hornbill, like the one we were watching earlier today, is not, it doesn't eat very big stuff. It eats largely fruit. It will take insects. Sorry, it eats largely insects, but it will also eat fruit and that sort of thing. And it might take something up to the size of a scorpion, you know, sort of that size. And that's about as big as they will take. But then you get the yellow-billed hornbill, which has got a much bigger beak, a much heavier bill, although the bird itself is not much bigger. And they will take things up to the size of a chameleon, so like a reptile that big and maybe even a, a frog or two. And then you get everything up to the size of the southern ground hornbill, which is a huge turkey-like bird, which will stand that high off the dashboard there. And they've got an enormous chisel-like beak. And the biggest thing that they would take, well, they'll eat any piece of meat that they can get. They'll, they'll try and catch small mammals. They might scavenge a bit. But that big tortoise that we saw earlier today, that would be about the size limit for a ground hornbill. And they smash into the bill, into the uh, back of the shell. And they're one of the only birds in the world that I know of that are able to do that. And certainly one of the only proper enemies of a large leopard tortoise. So we're coming into the shady area now, and we're going to head up towards Biffles Hook Dam, where I've no doubt there's nothing drinking. Oh, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. And Shofa, I'm going to get to your question about wings now. You're absolutely correct, by the way. There was a little, there, can you see it, Brian? Yeah? Now, I'm going to be very, very quiet here. That is not a small donkey. It is a tiny water buck. And it got a fright and got up and ran. Now, what is interesting here is that the kudu and the water buck, when they have babies, will closet them in a thick piece of bush like this and leave them alone while they go off to drink. And what that does is it just saves them from going too close to water where at this time of the year, the predators, well, this, these sorts of conditions, the predators will be concentrating their activities. And so the kudu and the young water buck, unlike the impala, which move with the herd almost immediately, will be left alone in the thick bush for a while until they can move properly, until they're big enough to escape predators. And that's what that little thing is doing. It's the tiniest little water buck I've ever seen. And I just don't want to make too much noise because it will get a fright. Isn't it sweet? It's a very, very different strategy from something like an impala species or even a zebra, which don't leave their young anywhere. Now, what it brings up is the interesting topic. I'll try and roll forward a bit. It brings up the interesting topic of things like sable and roan, which have a strategy that is even more along the lines of the one I've just discussed, where their whole strategy for keeping their babies safe is to leave them in long grass. Hello, little fellow. Oh, it's too sweet for words. And they can't do that in the Sabi sands because we're never very far away from water. And you'll find also that that water buck, because of the strategy of leaving them hidden while the adults go off to drink, will have almost no scent at all. It won't smell. Whereas the adults, of course, you can smell from miles away. This little thing won't smell at all. Isn't it sweet?
So, of course, what I often forget to tell you, because you can't really get an impression of the size from the screen you're looking at, that is the size of a sort of small, about the size of a goat. Um, dog, if we were talking about dogs, I guess it would be the, what, Brian, the size of a tall Alsatian, if you like. Sort of about the mass of an Alsatian, but a bit taller. It's tiny. And we've disturbed it now, of course, and so it doesn't really know what to do. And so I'm not going to start the engine, I'm afraid. I'm just going to wait here until it settles a bit. It's waiting for its mum to come back from the water where she will be drinking. But already, many of the instincts that it will need to survive are intact. It's looking around, it's listening all the time. It knows to scratch itself to get the ticks off. It's wagging its tail to get rid of the flies. You can see how stocky the legs are in comparison with the rest of the body. Despite the fact that it is very little and looks very vulnerable, like a lamb almost, there's no ways I could catch that thing. It would run at a tremendous speed. So although it looks completely helpless, it isn't really. Those legs are, they're born with very well-muscled and well-developed legs. Gail, you've been watching Wild Earth for seven years, which is a dedication um, Quite astonishing dedication. Thank you, Gail. You say this is the first time you've seen such a tiny waterbuck. I think it's the first time I've seen such a tiny waterbuck as well. And just like the zebra, remember that tiny zebra foal? Look how difficult it is for this little youngster to reach the ground with its head, because that's not what it's designed to do at the moment. At the moment, it's still well designed for suckling. right in the middle of the road now. Now, were I a leopard to come past here, this would definitely be my breakfast. And Anna Marie, of course, I mean, I should have answered this question before you even asked it. How old do I think this waterbuck is? I'd say less than a week, maybe a week, maybe a week old. It's very little. And for the mum to be have left it, I think they'll probably adopt the strategy of leaving their youngsters probably for about two to three weeks. It is very, very cuddly looking, isn't it? Brenda, of course, you're absolutely correct. The, the waterbuck should be lying down waiting for mum, and it was lying down until we drove past. Oh, we didn't even see it. It just exploded out of the bush next to me. And that's why it stood up, and that's why I don't want to start the car again. I want to try and just let it go into the bush and lie down again. But yes, of course, it should be lying in the thick bush, which is exactly what it was doing. It's inevitably what we do sometimes, I'm afraid, is we do create disturbances just simply by being out here. But there's nothing we can do about that. Hello, Jen B. You've been watching since 2008, and you said it's the first time you've heard why we don't see baby waterbuck. You know what, until somebody had asked, until I saw this thing lying in the bush there, if you'd asked me why we don't see baby waterbuck, I'm not sure I would have been able to answer you. 
I'm not sure what it's doing there. I think it's sniffing the air. And probably just opening up that track to the organ of Jacobson so it can interpret the smells that are coming into its mouth and its nose. But you can see it doesn't see us as a threat. It doesn't. I mean, no adult waterbuck will get anywhere close to this near to us. It has no idea what we are. Jeffrey, you've also have been watching for a while, and you say this is the youngest waterbuck you've ever seen. It's definitely the youngest I've ever seen. And Dr. Debbie, you reckon it looks like a cross between a donkey and an impala. I think that is an absolutely brilliant description of what it is. It looks just, it, it has real donkey-like vibe about it, doesn't it? Very special. Let's try and I'm going to be quiet again for the next 20 seconds or so. Just see what you can hear and get an impression. Take a deep breath in. Imagine yourself in a at the, with the temperature climb where it's just about to make you start sweating. So just imagine that and listen. Take a deep breath in and listen to what I'm hearing. smiling at us or maybe he's got some spider webs stuck in his lips but what you can't see is that he doesn't have top teeth which of course makes it much easier for mum when he's suckling so what you can hear there is almost nothing it's completely silent the heat has already started to build so the dawn chorus the sparse dawn chorus that sounded is now already calm just through the echoing down through the drainage line, you can see we're on the edges of the Mlorati drainage line here. You can hear the odd white brow scrub robin, a rattling cysticula or two. I heard a green backed bleating warbler or green backed Cameroptera, as they're now called. And also in the way distance, ancient spot bat is going. But otherwise, everything is completely at peace now. Now, if it has no smell, Diane, you want to know how on earth will its mother find it if it's moved from where it was. Diane, what it will do, and it's inevitable that it will move once or twice, because it will be disturbed either by an elephant coming past or a buffalo coming past or something like that. The, they'll call. She will come into the general vicinity and make a call, and the youngster will then respond, and that's how they will reunite. until it is very sure that mum is around, it will be very quiet. I just wish it would lie down. It's just amazing. Hello, Anne Schorfer. Interesting one from you. If a predator comes along, I'll have to help out because we disturbed it. Mm. And that's a tough one. Yes, we did disturb it, but would it not have been disturbed by something else at some stage during the day? I don't know. 
would I be prepared to... So here's, here's one for you, Anne. Let's say Karula came along here and we knew that Karula's cubs were still around. Would we then try and save the baby waterbuck or would we allow Karula, knowing that she had youngsters, devour this little waterbuck? I don't know. I take your point, though, Anne. I'm not sure I'd try and get in the way of a charging lion there if it wished to eat this impala slash donkey. All right, what we are going to do now, everybody, is I'm going to roll past him, and I'm just going, because I think he's not going to lie down while we're here. So let's roll past and leave him be. Wasn't that just the most special sighting? have to start the car. Don't get a fright, little one. Jeffrey, while I try and start this recalcitrant vehicle, you want to know if the baby will also make vocalizations in the same way that the mother will call Yes, it will. I'm sure it'll make little bleats. I cannot make this vehicle. There we go. No. Still not. OK, while I try and get this car moving, let's get across to Scott, and I'll catch up with you once we've left this little water buck. Seriously looking forward to seeing exactly how minute this little water buck is, but it sounds like it's created quite a stir. So good for you guys and James. Vim and I have just been responding to some squirrel alarm calls, but we found a snake eagle at the end of them, not the leopard that we've been looking for all day. Just kind of returning, we've done a big loop around the south and southeastern reaches of Juma. Now we're looping back to where we had these last tracks of hers around the Juma waterhole. And hopefully we'll be able to try and work out where she headed from, from those last tracks that we're heading straight down towards the waterhole from kind of the final control room. We've got no idea of exactly when she moved past there. We can speculate. James heard some, some vocalizations earlier this morning. So we all feel that it's quite fresh, but it could have happened a couple of hours before we got up, or even more than that. We will never know the answer to that question, sadly. But what we will be able to do is find out where these tracks are leading towards and hopefully get a better idea as, as to where exactly she is at the moment. She could have got down into the, the Wasi Riverbed, which is just down to our left, which flows away from the Juma Dam and Juma Waterhole. As you can see from here, though, it's not easy to look into the riverbed from here. Even though it's nice and open and clear down in there, there's this fringe of riparian vegetation that's quite thick along the banks. slowly heating up into the scorch of a day that James forecasted, but for now still not too bad. It's been surprisingly cool this morning. Hello to Brian, who would like to know if we will ever get enough rain to fill the dams up. I most certainly hope so. If we don't, we are doomed as a planet. So there will be rain at some stage, and yes, the dams will fill up. Whether it's this season, Brian, I don't think so. It could be that it's going to be earlier into the uh, into next summer that we get the rain. Okay, we found where Karula is headed. Here are the tracks. Dink, 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 dink. She continues along here. 
it's just interesting because it's where we had the, the monkeys alarm, uh, the squirrels alarm calling earlier. Hmm. Okay. What to do now? So that's interesting. I mean, the Duma Wattsall camera VM, you, can, you might want to point it out. It's straight across there. And she was last seen about 50 meters, or at least the last tracks were about 50 meters away. And then she's come somewhere from there. Along here. So she came along this pathway. She could well have even sent marked up against the tree here. The ground's very hard when, where I am here though. But her tracks do continue down this pathway. Not easy to see them though. But she walked along the same path that I've just been walking now. I'm literally standing on her tracks. Hmm. So what is too sure what to suggest now there's some rattling some sticklers alarm calling nearby here maybe they've seen her maybe she's not too far Sorry, though, back to your question. I don't know when there gonna, is going to be more rain, but like I said, if there's not more rain at some point, we're doomed. Um, so, whether it's in the next few months before our winter, hopefully, if not, it is going to be a spectacle to behold because these droughts don't come by very often and we can consider ourselves lucky to a degree in order the fact that we can witness what unfolds in the coming months because it is going to be hectic that i can assure you just varying degrees thereof good news is james is also working in area now that the leopard is heading towards the leopards heading kind of north and east from central of the dam up towards Gauri cut line. Now the tricky thing is of course by not following each track, track for track, or at least on the trail of them, she could easily have looped back over this road and while I was looking back at you missed her track. So, that's what makes our lives difficult, trying to track down these animals for you without leaving you behind, which is obviously not really an option. That's already playing on my mind. Has she already done her usual perula swervy movements? She doesn't like to head in one direction, this lady. to New Zealand who is wondering where the water comes from and you are right Matt it does indeed come from a borehole you may have seen a strange little wooden structure at the bottom of Philemon's dip and that is the pump house that interestingly enough is taking four times as long to fill up our tanks as it used to indicating that the water table is drying up. And it's one thing the animals not having water out here, it's going to be another thing if, if we don't have animal uh, water out here because we'll be forced to probably evacuate, I guess. And Marcel, you were just wondering what exactly would happen. Time will tell. But if the, the, wa the water boreholes dry up here, I fear that it would be a huge expense and not an easy fix to get water to us. And without water, we will have to leave. Let's hope it doesn't get to that stage, but it is a reality, I guess. to join. 
Georgie in Australia, who is a seasoned safari goer and has been out to Africa five times. But on only one occasion has Georgie managed to see an aardwolf and is wondering if we get many sightings of them here. Not, sadly not, the Salu Sands is not where you want to come if you want to see aardwolf. I would suggest going elsewhere. Where? I'm not too sure actually are good places to see them. I've only seen one or two in my entire existence and I was in the Karoo, the central parts of South Africa, central and I guess southern parts of South Africa. Um, I think there was one documented here about 20 years ago, from what, I, what I'm told, Georgie. So, and Brent seems to think he saw tracks of one the other day. Um, so, that's it um, regarding our wolf sightings in the Savi Sands. Not, not common here. Come on, Karoo. in Canada who has her feet up to the monitor hoping to absorb some African sunlight and warmth. Shame, I'm sorry to hear that you're freezing in Canada. Janet's interested to know how the surrounding villages are doing water-wise and as far as I'm aware no problems yet but I think for them just like us the, the, the the problem could become critical very quickly and there's no no way of knowing, at least I'm not a specialist, but I don't think you can predict when your borehole is going to run out. But if and when it does, it's going to be tough times for everyone out here. But like I said, that hasn't happened yet, but it is, it, it is something to think about in the back of your mind because it could well happen at some point. Just be, be prepared for anything, I guess. All right, well, it sounds like James has found you some more animals. We're going to drive up this road and probably turn around and come straight back down it, I'm guessing. It's probably going to be our game plan to try and work out where Karula has gone. Possibly the most stunning antelope that we get out here the greater kudu beautiful bull there and doubly special because making his world premiere on live wildlife internet broadcasting is david on camera well done dave and what this kudu is doing of course is eating that's a stupid thing an obvious thing to point out but it is eating red bush willow combritum apiculatum and they are very tannin-rich plants, and I suspect quite strongly that kudu, which are susceptible to tannin poisoning, would not be eating this plant necessarily with such enthusiasm unless there wasn't a great deal else for it to eat. Isn't he magnificent? He's a huge bull. He's probably about 270 kilograms, and if I try and convert that to pounds, it'll probably explode my mind, but I'm gonna try and do it anyway. Roughly 800 pounds. Vast fellow, and with one, two, three, four curls in his horns, probably almost eight years old. You see how he has to move his head back every time he wants to get under a branch, but like us trying to get out with, um, you know, with our aerial, and that does make them very susceptible to predation by lions. Brilliant. He's still got in there, Dave. Is he gone? Okay. Dave was whispering there. He doesn't want to be heard on camera. Okay, let's... We're gonna we'll sort of help out Scott here, I hope. We'll try to help Scott out. Um, well done, Dave. 
We are going to be going down Hyena Road. Now, just to give you a quick lay of the land before we carry on, Scott is over there on a road called Gauri Cutline. The Juma Dam is also a block further than that away, and the female leopard's tracks are heading towards, I think, this drainage line here, or which is a tributary of the Mlilwatis, and it feeds into or feeds out of Biffles Hook Dam. And this is the third or fourth time we've seen female leopard tracks going into this area, into this drainage line. Is it maybe Karula going back to a den site? I don't know. We can't drive in there. We're certainly not going to walk in there at this stage. It could be. She killed just to the east of us two days ago. She killed a young waterbuck. She's now done a patrol off to the west and come back into the same area. I don't know. Interesting stuff. Unless this is a female unrelated, but I mean, that would be highly, highly unusual and unlikely. So, Scott will be on one side of the drainage line and I will be on the other. And we'll see if we can't come up with something. I'm going to drive very, very slowly. Half because I want to spot anything and half because Hyena Road, of course, is, well, I mean, describing it as a road is to give it a compliment that it most sorely does not deserve. Right, we're going to roll gently down here. Hello, Chris from Oregon on Ustream Chatters. You think that Karula's hiding on the back of the Land Rover and watching Scott and I. And unless I'm very much blind, and unless Brian has failed to look over the back of the vehicle once during the course of the morning. Brian, will you just look over the back there, please? See a leopard there? Not right now. Not right now. So, not on this car, Chris. Maybe on Scott's. Let's get VM. VM is, of course, slightly shorter than Brian, and so maybe he's unable to see over the back of the Land Rover. Now, it's these little drainage line areas that will provide patches of cave and hole for a leopard if she was to try put her cubs into an area like that. We'll just gently ease along here. Well, seeing tracks on hard ground like this is not easy. Scott's done really well today to spot as many tracks as he has. I'm most impressed. Schofer, sorry, I forgot completely about your question. You were asking about, I yacked on at you about, about the shape of the brown snake eagle's wings, and then we saw that little water buck. And you said, I spoke about the fact that a wide and, or a long and broad wing is difficult for flapping. It's not efficient for flapping. And you said, is that why a vulture has to wait till the middle of the day, or till the heat of the day, like around about now, before it's able to take off? That is exactly why, Anne. Precisely why a vulture with its wide and long wings is unable, or not unable, but it's very inefficient to flap. So a bird like a Franklin, for example, or a grouse, which has got not long wings, but uh, sort of short, broad wings, can flap very fast and get up into the air quickly. Whereas a vulture like that, which is not designed for flapping, will have longer and broader wings. And then you've got something like an albatross, for example, which has got very long, but very thin wings, probably only about that, that fat, very thin wings. And what they are able to do, they actually can't, they can't raise, you raise your shoulders like this. They cannot raise their shoulders above the horizontal. So where we can do that, they have a locking mechanism in there and they can actually rest their wings in that position. And their wings, because of they, they, they can't flap properly. They can't take off unless they've got wind. 
and so they live in, in environments where there's almost consistent, constant wind, and they hang in the air on that wind. And you, and you can see that with, even with gulls that live around the sea. So lots of different shapes of wings and tails for different strategies. Now, Jeffrey in Texas, you want to know, did I know that the bird actually creates a vortex of lower pressure above it when it's flying, which sucks it further up into the air? Well, Jeffrey, I did kind of know that. I wouldn't have put it like that, but yes. I mean, that's the cold concept of lift that I was reading about yesterday. And what happens with a bird's wing? It's an aerofoil, basically. And the, the best way for you to, to actually experience this is to the next time you're driving along a highway, stick your hand out the window and angle it like that. And you'll notice that even without any muscle, your arm will immediately go up. Now that's a little bit like a bird's wing or an aerofoil. And what happens is because of the shape of the wing, it's curved over the top and, um, or, yeah, so it's curved over the top and sort of uh, flatter underneath, a bit like an aeroplane's wing. And what that means is that the air moving over the top of the wing moves at a greater speed than the air moving under the wing. And the faster the air moves, it's a sort of interesting physical relationship between pressure and velocity of air, the faster the air moves, the less the pressure. So there's less pressure above the wing than there is underneath the wing. So the greater pressure above the, underneath the wing pushes up the less pressure that Jeffrey was talking about creates this area of low pressure above the wing and that creates lift and that's why the bird goes up. Of course it must be moving forward for this to happen and that's why flapping birds flap like, I mean if you're thinking of doing breaststroke that's basically what a bird's doing in the air, it's pushing the air back and creating thrust or forward momentum and then those wings provide the lift. It is an amazing thing to consider the complications of flight. And while we're driving along here, not seeing a great deal, we were chatting about vultures earlier and the fact that they've got those fingers at the end of their wings. And those fingers, of course, are not just there for the sake of it. They are there to... I'm just looking around the place. They are there to reduce what is called induced drag. And induced, uh, not induced drag, it's turbulence. So what happens when the bird is flying along the lower pressure air and the high pressure air will equ equilibrate, and often that happens behind the bird, but in a long-winged bird like that, it creates turbulence at the tips of the wings, and those little feathers at the end of the wings help to break up that turbulence and stop it. It is just, it's just incredible what nature, as the book I was reading yesterday said, nature has got at least a million years jump on us as it, with regard to aerodynamics and the ability to sort of fly stably in the air. You can see no leopards here. I can see that the sun is becoming very bright and that the sky is going from a very pleasant blue. And as we look further towards the sun, it's now sort of starting to bleach out. Ah, good. Cat in Tampa and Jen B, you both have said that the, the yellow-fronted canary is a new bird for you. Cat, I think you're on 51, and Jen B, you're on 104. Good stuff. Well done. It's not, a, like I say, not an uncommon bird, but just very difficult to see on camera. Now, it's entirely possible that this leopard could have crossed this road, but the road is very unwieldy and it is very difficult to see the tracks on. Siberia Zumi, 
Now, Zoomy, just quickly, for those of you who don't know, the Zoomies are the tireless champions of the wilderness who operate the camera at the Juma Dam Cam. So when you hear us talk about a name and then Zoomy, they are one of the people that spend time every day, give of their time to operate the camera at the dam and bring wonderful live wildlife pictures to you around the world, free of charge. Thank you to you, all of you. And Siberia, you say that you think the Leopard S came past the dam at about two to four this morning. Yeah, I would say from the look of those tracks, that is well, well possible. You didn't actually see her, I don't think, but you say that is well possible. And you also say that you think the closest bird to a, to a roadrunner is a secretary bird. They do look the same, Siberia, but I'm, I don't know that they're related. They could be. I'll stop here and have a quick listen. Just looking in a marula tree there that looks like a leopard should be draped from its bowels. Just listening to the radio quick. Oh, we've just had an update from Ephraim that says he's seen tracks going across the cheetah cut line to the west, so at least the east. So it's quite possible that. No, hang on a second. Ephraim, confirm east or west? Scott, were those tracks going east or west? Sorry, difficulties here. Confirm those tracks were going east or west? West, west. Okay, copy, thanks. Sorry, the tracks of another animal coming onto Juma from the eastern side. Obviously not the same one. I say animal because I'm, I think it was a leopard, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so it goes. You win some, you lose some. No, nothing here on Hyena Road, not even a hyena, Brian. And David, now that we're acknowledging David's presence in the world. And little Waterbuck was just down there. So I'm going to not go down that way. We're going to continue back towards the Gari cut line where Scott was. You may find that little baby water bug draped in a tree this afternoon. I hope not. Oh, this nice breeze. Ah. Now, Kathy, you're in Memphis, Tennessee, and you want to know how do we know the difference between a kudu and a nyala. Kathy, once you've seen them both together, you would never make a mistake. Also, once you've seen them live, remember that your ability to judge size from where you are is, is much more difficult than it is from where we are. It's almost impossible from the screen to get a size unless there's a human being standing in or something that you know the size of standing in the picture. So a kudu is much bigger than a nyala. It's got, it's a very different color as well. And so, I mean, a nyala cow, for example, is that rich russet red with white stripes on it. A kudu cow and kudu bull of a much sort of grayer brown color with white stripes. The kudu bull, of course, is that charcoal shaggy coat uh, with a few white stripes. The horns are different. And then the other member of the family that we get is the bushbuck, which is smaller again and has spotting rather than striping. And also a kind of, um, it's a darker, a darker sort of liver chestnut brown, probably even darker than that. So if you saw them together, Kathy, you wouldn't know, you would you definitely wouldn't mistake them, but I can absolutely understand how when you're looking at them on the screen, especially if we just go past them, uh, they do look very similar, especially with young animals.
And that's because they're the same family, same genus, very closely related to each other. Scott is back at the Gallego pan. He is with the poor little hippo that we disturbed earlier today. Let's go and get an update from him. So I'm told that there's not only the hippo here that we can see, but also the one at the Jumawatal. So two hippos lurking around this area. Not easy to see at the moment, and we'll probably continue, but just for interest sakes, we thought we'd bring you across just to confirm that there are two hippo. It did move out of the little water hole in front of us, where the two impala are now, just as we arrived. So obviously feeling a little bit shy about its tiny little puddle. No luck with any further female leopard tracks. We found some male leopard tracks though on our northern boundary and they crossed north away from us. So three different sets of leopard tracks seen this morning and even though no leopards are oh no impala. At least we've got a lot of leopard moving around the property. Come on, time to go. Quarantine. Young male leopard has been found. I'm not sure with what kill, but there's just remains of it. What an awesome scene! Um, so you'll be a lot of you will be happy to hear that the quarantine male leopard is well. He's east of us on Torchwood, and the Inkohoma pride, believe it or not, have crossed onto Buyatella, onto Juma. We only just got that update now a few minutes ago, so not enough time to go across there and start searching for them, but certainly good prospects for this afternoon. I'm sure we'll be able to find them. And it's frustrating. I mean, we turned 100 meters before, the, uh, before where they crossed over Cheetah Cut Line. We turned onto Central Road, and they were just a little bit north of us. 100 meters, and then we would have been on their trail. But you can't be everywhere at once. But interesting to know that it wasn't just the leopard that we've been missing narrowly this morning, but even the lion, it just seems like luck has not been on our side today, which is fine, because it will hopefully be on our side this afternoon or tomorrow. see exactly where it is. It's somewhere out towards that dead tree that you're looking at there. Austin, you'd like to know, shadow has been seen on Sibambili in the last week, and I'm not sure. I, I've got no idea, and um, we can try and find out for you, um, but I, I don't have a clue. I'm 99% certain, though, that we did have a tracks on Buyatella this morning, quite close to Sibambili and heading straight towards Wanaipan in Sibambili. So she could well be there this morning. She's been lurking. She kind of lurks between Arethusa, Sibambili, and Juma. She covers three different traverse areas or properties. But no further confirmation also whether she does have any cubs or not. There is a chance that she may. Sounds good. Sit down. Oh, what's going on in there? Jigger. Eh? Sounds like a 
right. It's free wheel down the hill if you're a breather. <laughs> BM just said indigestion. <laughs> um, okay, well, Bev, you would like to know a little bit about how to go about doing the, the bird lists and whether you should be writing down red billed hornbill and yellow billed hornbill. Well, hornbill's all the same. No, you must certainly write down each uh, individual species. Um, so not just canary, not just hornbill, the specific canaries, the specific hornbills. And <clears throat> that way you'll be able to rack up a list in no time. I think you're on 36, you should be able to get up to 100 very quickly. If not, tell us to stop for more birds. We've got one viewer, Mike in Florida, Bev, and he's up to 250 birds and he's hit a bit of a, a dead end now. It's difficult to, to go beyond that in the same area. So hopefully he's doing his best to spread the safari live word so we can go and film in some other destinations at some point. That way bird lists will be able to grow as will mammal lists, experience lists, all the lists. in Florida, you'd like to know if we get any bush pig. And not that I've ever seen in the Sabi Sands, but in other parts of Kruger, you'll definitely get them in more forested areas, thicker areas. And throughout uh, South Africa, you, you'll actually find bush pig. Uh, and Africa, it's, it's a very widespread animal. But they do like thicker, more jungle-like habitat. There's one animal that I've sadly not seen too much of in my life. They're also nocturnal, which makes uh, it quite tricky seeing them. Very interesting animals that apparently lions don't like eating. They catch them for sport, but don't feed on them, which I find hard to believe, but apparently it is the case. It's been documented, not every time, but on a few occasions, lions abandoning bush pig that they've killed. Must be a good sport there being a lion taking on a bush pig, quite a large number of prey to wrestle down. Well team, it's time to say goodbye and thank you for joining on the Sunrise Safari. Sorry we didn't find any big cats for you, but there are good prospects for the Inkahuma Pride being tracked down this afternoon, and who knows, maybe Kurula will pop in for a visit. I'll be out on tracking team helping to find those animals for you, and it'll be Brent and James out and drive. Viam, thanks for your camera work. Nikki, thank you for directing the show, and Kirsty, well done for lending her a hand in the final control room. We'll send you over to James now for the rest of the safari. A very distressing news of the Inkahuma pride there, of course. The fact that they have decided to come onto the reserve over the top of the tracks of Scott. Scott drove that cheetah cut line today. He's on form at the moment. I don't believe he would have missed their tracks, which means that they've crossed onto Vuyatela or Juma while we were driving around here and basically they've remained undetected so we'll have to go and try and find them this afternoon i'm very irritated by this still it's been a very pleasant drive i think it's going to be like i said earlier a deeply scorching midday but that is the way of things in the summer and especially in the summer drought oh dear i've pulled myself out I was trying to be fancy, you see. All right, I'm back, Nikki. I'm back. Oh, 45 seconds left. Thank you very much for your kind comments and words. Somebody's asking when I'm going to be writing a new book. I think that's Maddie. Um, 
I'm in the I'm in the process of it, Maggie. I'm in the process of it. It's going to take a little while, though. It's it is the slow process. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dave. Well done, Dave. They will be on camera full time this afternoon. Big thank you to the final control, full of Nikki and Kirsten and Leanne, also making her world debut in the directing two chair this morning, and of course to Scott and Viam on the other vehicle. We will see you later this afternoon. Uh, it'll be four o'clock. Very hot. We'll try and remain alive until then. See you. Bye-bye.